podcast episode five. This is the Anthony Prisotto Business Insider Podcast. The podcast devoted to giving you the right advice to help take your salon business to the next level. It doesn't matter if you are an industry veteran or a new salon owner ready to open your doors for the first time. The Business Insider podcast shares entertaining stories along with practical tips and interviews with other salon owners, all aimed at helping you take your salon from surviving to thriving. And now, here is your host, Anthony Prisotto. Hi everybody, it's Anthony Prisotto here, and I'd like to welcome you back to my Business Insider podcast, or if this is your first time here, thanks for joining us. Today I had the opportunity to catch up with a dear friend of mine, Russell Mays. Some of you may know Russell from his online forum, hamhaven.com, or his latest venture, The Union, which is a group of awesome guys who are providing independent education to stylists in the United States. And that's what Russell and I are talking about in this podcast, The Union Wizard Council, Free Education, Paid Education, and his current project, mentoring 10 stylists starting out in their career. Okay, so Russell, tell us a bit about uh, the Wizard Council. Uh, the, the, the Wizard Council was originally a group of guys, you know, uh, John Allenoff and, and Mark Booth and myself that, that got together. And, and we started thinking about how it's inspiring for us, the three of us, to get together and, and, and just kind of talk hair. And sometimes there will be somebody there that needs a haircut, and we'll just kind of jam and do some hair. And, and we thought that that's, that's what really makes the industry great, and it's that, that connection that, that you have with other like-minded hairdressers. And so we, we originally started that, well, maybe we could do like a there, – there used to be um, a something here in the United States called the National Cosmetology Association, NCA. And I think they're still around, but not in the capacity that they, that they are today or that they used to be. And they had little individual, little – little groups in every city across the country and you would have a monthly meeting and sometimes they would do presentations and they'd get together with different people and it was just a monthly membership you know and you had your own little council in every city across the country and then they'd have a national meeting where everybody would come together and it was a really great a grassroots kind of thing that, that built a lot of camaraderie in, in the industry and I thought that that would be a really great thing if we got together a group of like-minded people. So I thought we, if we could do something kind of like that, where we would have just like some cool people would get together and we would just all share. And it, and it grew to where we ended up trying to make a, a, an actual coherent presentation of independent education. It wasn't really product-based or anything. And, and it's just kind of grown. This was our, our third event that uh, John called it the Wizard Council because he had been reading a lot of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> he has a son that he's been reading Lord of the Rings to. So okay. he's just thought, oh, that's awesome. So I think we're actually going to change the name of the union to Wizard Council because it, it, it was so you know on point for what we were trying to do. Um, and so this one was, you know, Michael Levine was coming down from Canada to just a vacation. He said, hey, we should get together and do something. And he thought he would come by my salon and just do something. He had no idea I was going to throw an event around him coming down. And so we kind of surprised him with this whole event. We had um, uh, 80 people in the salon that would really only hold about 50, and it was it was just freaking <laughs> packed with people. And uh, I was I was shocked at how many people we had, and it was a really great turnout. And and I think that it shows that there there is a lot of, if not necessarily hunger for education, but hunger for that connection and that camaraderie and and the uplifting of the, the reputation of the industry that, that is really kind of lacking today because it's become such a, a sales shtick everywhere you go. And, and education is nothing but care and stick from a product company that they're offering and everything has been diluted and, and convoluted. And so we're just trying to, to, to present quality hair from our perspective. And so this one was about instead of the hair color complementing the haircut, we have this uh, really great colorist called Allison Daza. Uh, she's working with Davinus. And so we decided that we would have some models and she could do anything she wanted. We just wanted bright 
intense colors, some muted, some not muted, but some subtle and some really extreme. And you, you saw the pictures from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just wanted bright colors and we wanted the haircut to complement the hair color as opposed to the haircut being the, the biggest prong in the fork. We wanted the hair color to take kind of front row with this. And the greatest part of the whole presentation is when we brought all the color models out, there was an audible gasp. <gasps> in the audience and, and that was so great for her to see that that kind of reaction to the color that she did and it some of the color was absolutely gorgeous and beautiful and it was all done in a classy way and yeah. none of it was just for shock value it was all pretty color even though it was bright it was all still pretty yeah, yeah that, that's so one thing i, I, I like that I, I saw the looking at the photos they were really for, for bright colors. They weren't just in your face. They were nice, which yeah, is something you don't see. It was punk rock. It, yeah. it was glamour. Yeah, you know, glamour done in a, a a really bright primary colored style, which I think is very difficult to do. It's easy to just color somebody's hair pink and undercut it and disconnect it, and yep. oh, I got cool hair. But I, I'm so bored with that. I, I am so bored with education, and I, I use air quotes with this education being all about let me stand up and show you what an awesome hair cutter I am by undercutting and disconnecting it and trying to out Sassoon Sassoon. If I'm going to copy what Sassoon has done, and don't get me wrong, I think Mark Hayes is a genius and brilliant and one of my absolute favorite hairdressers of all time. And he does magnificent work. But if I just copy that, you know, it's just kind of like, why, why copy it? Do something a little different. Do something in your own style. And, and I've seen photographs, you know, on Hairbrain that I look at and I think that is a direct copy of what Sassoon Collection did a couple of years ago. And, it, and it's just kind of, it's kind of lame in my humble opinion. <laughs> and not that, not that what the hair I do is all that edgy and great. I tend to do a, a real, you know, I try to do pretty hair. I, I'm over disconnected, undercut asymmetrical shit. I'm, I'm over it. Let's do something that's even on both sides. Let's do something that's that's connected and blended through. Or It's just so easy to to make a statement and have some drama by undercutting and disconnecting an, asym an asymmetrical, you know, making something asymmetrical. It's difficult to have that same drama and, and something that is connected and even and balanced and all that stuff. And so that's always the, the mindset that I take when I'm trying to do you know, hair for presentations. I want to do something that's pretty, and I want to do something that has a little bit of drama to it in some way to capture someone's attention. And sometimes I, I hit it, and sometimes I don't. But I, I don't know. I'm, what was the question? I, <laughs> I got lost there. Uh, I, 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 so did I. But yeah, it, it's really true. And, and I, feel like, I feel like Michael in his first interview where he's just started, he's like, what was the question again? <laughs> it, it, I think pretty hair and Elegant hair is, is, is very much in the focus of, I know with the clients I do, yeah. I, I'm doing hardly any disconnected, undercut, and, and I'm even at the point I'm starting to turn those sort of people away. It's just not the yeah. space I'm in. It's just not what I want to do. I want to do pretty hair. I want to do something that looks beautiful, you know, and maybe I'm just getting it's too fun to old do. to be edgy. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean, it's still fun to do. Oh, yeah. But. If I'm going to present something to another hairdresser and, and to my group of peers, I can't do just something that I've always done or have just do the same stuff or, or copy someone else's stuff without changing it some way, shape or form or doing it. the edginess of an undercut, disconnected, asymmetrical thing, you know, with bold bangs is no longer edgy. It's it, to me, it's no longer interesting. You know, like when I see stuff, I'd rather see that beautiful blowout kind of Veronica Lake kind of finger wave thing. That is so difficult to do. I mean, I wish I could do that Veronica Lake kind of sexy wave thing. That is magnificently, that captures my eye, even though it's not new or edgy or that's like, wow, that captures my eye. If I see another bowl cut, I'm like, man, whatever, mm -hmm. next. Yep. It, it doesn't capture my eyes. So sometimes I, I tend to not put stuff out because it's just kind of like the same thing I've done before. And it's my comfort zone. The only time it's really worth putting something out, you know, to my peers is when it's out of my comfort zone. And, and then let, let's see what the results are. And it's a scary thing to put yourself out there. And, and you know, because you always think, oh, I'm going to put this out. And I'm like, eh, it's not perfect. And you think everyone's going to shit all over it and poo-poo you. 
but uh, you know, you do what you can. And, and that's the scary thing about putting your own work out and your own content out. It's, it's never good enough. Uh, Josh posted something from Ira Glass that was about uh, your level of taste and your level of skill not living up to that taste level. And, and that's the, the, the path that every artist is on is you, you have this idea and this vision of what you want but your skill level can't get you there. And so you're always disappointed with your work. And I don't know that that ever really goes away. I mean, I've been doing hair for a while, a long time. I hesitate to say it because then you'll judge me based on how old I am. <laughs> but I've been hair, you know, 28 years, 29 years. And there's been very few haircuts I ever look at and say, that's good. I always look at it, you know, with a critical eye and think, oh, I could do it better here. I could do better there. Yeah, I like that part there. There's always something that's a little bit off. And, and one of the things that I'm trying to do now that I've been doing the last couple of weeks is my last client of the day, I will look at it and say, okay, I'm going to do this hair for myself. It's not for the client. It's not for the salon. It's the last one I can run behind if I want to. But this is one that I'm going to do for myself. And I'll take my time and I'll really try to, to do something that makes me pleased, that, that makes me proud. Whether it's blowing it out better than I usually do, being a little more meticulous about it, you know, uh, using a different tool, fine-tuning the cut a little bit more, and really paying less attention to the client and, and, and more attention to me as an artist. That's something that I've been trying to do in a salon lately. But, you know, like, I, like you and I, we're both salon based hairdressers so it's maybe that that changes the 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 lens that we focus the hair business on because we work in the salon and we deal with the client all the time whereas i mean i know some guys are just platform artists and they just go around and teach and it's it's real easy to just you know get, get off into that world of, of trying to impress hairdressers as opposed to trying to impress a client. They're, they're really different mindsets. So. Most definitely. That, that sort of leads into my next topic was education, the quality of free education out there. I, I remember us talking yeah. probably a couple of years ago, and I really loved the comment you had. It was that everybody's got a camera now, so everybody's become an educator. And yeah. <laughs> And it, it, it seems to be true and even more so, but I, I guess I'm seeing more education appearing that's not so bad. I think everyone has got a camera. There's a lot of people putting out stuff that is not necessarily good. It's free. A lot yeah. of it tends to be, from my point of view, let's see how I can shred this hair up, but I have a really cool technique to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily yeah. producing good hair. Yeah, um, I, I think that a lot of hairdressers, and this is this is myself included, I'm not distancing myself because I see it in myself too. I, I think that the, everybody in the hair business is a little insecure, especially in the United States. I mean, because the United States being a hairdresser is not a real glamorous job. You know, I don't know what it's like in Australia. I know in London, it's it's kind of it's a well-respected you know craft. But you know, in America, it's kind of like a step above being a waitress, you know, in a in a coffee shop. Not that there's anything wrong with being a server. I'm not. I'm just saying it. It's not something that people really look at or or glamorize unless you're you know one of the few celebrity hairdressers that does Britney Spears hair or something. But I think a lot of hairdressers they they strive for that that credibility and, and that being okay, being okay with my career and okay with myself and having some respect. So it, one way to, to gain respect in, in the business is that I'm an educator. I teach other hairdressers how to do hair. So it's kind of um, a title that I, I'll slap on my chest and say, oh, that makes me better than the average hairdresser, so you can trust me. Sort of you know, like segmenting yourself from others so that you, you kind of have a little credibility. This credibility is tough to gain in the business. I mean, because once you do a haircut, the haircut's gone. And if she's not making it look good, then you don't have a whole lot of credibility. Yeah. So I think that that a lot of young guys coming up into it are, 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 are striving to to kind of gain that credibility. And so the, the, they'll start sharing stuff. And if I share stuff on the Internet, I think it's really great. Uh, but sometimes if I share it from a place inside of me that is lacking – and that I'm trying to fill that that lack uh, of with that that insecurity in myself. I'm trying to fill that with uh, other people saying that it's good or okay. Does that make sense? I'm yeah. trying to fill it from a wrong position in myself. And instead of trying to give something, I'm trying to take something. So I'm sharing it not with the intent of sharing it. I'm sharing it with the intent of of taking something from the audience to fill the hole in my heart. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that that's where a lot of bad bad hair comes out uh, on 
you know, some videos and some pictures and, and things like that. And it, it's not about the craft of doing the hair or sharing something. It's a, it's, you know, me filling the hole in my heart. So if they can come from a position of, Oh, let me share this thing that I, that I think that I, that I learned, then I think it can be really great. And it can be something very, very simple. It doesn't have to be, you know, Oh, I'm going to uh, be the, the hair professor and drop some knowledge on you and blow your mind. It can be as simple as, okay, this is how you're going to hold some scissors. I saw uh, Christian Awesome, for instance, did a, a little how to hold your scissor tutorial that, that I thought was really great. And I think that is probably the best video that he did because it provided clear, concise information that can be really useful. I mean, I know the information. I, I know how to hold my scissors correct, but, but I can still appreciate it and respect it. I mean, he put it out for the right reasons. Does that make sense? Most definitely, and and I think yeah, there is a lot of that happening now, which is really great. Yeah, and and I think it does. Who who is good that you like? Who is good? Yeah. What what education have you seen that you've liked? That I've really liked. I'm always impressed by everything you yeah. do. Oh, I wasn't fishing for a compliment. <laughs> yeah, no, I um. I'll look, pay for you five bucks for that. One. I, I forget how long <laughs> how long ago we first met, uh, Hair Maven. Uh, I mm-hmm. bought your DVDs yeah. and. My learning curve was just so steep from then on. It, I, I, like you said, I look back over the first fifteen years of my career and think, "Shit, I was really bad." <laughs> you all yeah, deserve a yeah. refund, but yeah. So, oh, like, I like your stuff. It's great, DJ Muldoon. I, I really like a lot of the work he puts out. DJ's I, a really clean haircut. Though. He just absolutely brilliant, and it's, it's unfortunately the times he has a lot of his education on is doesn't work well here in Australia, but. It's great stuff. Joshua Flowers, mm-hmm. surprising me. He's coming up with some great stuff. Actually, I, I, he, something he said that on his last video that was really great was, you know, we, we all learn and get to a point where we learn to cut hair. And from there on, it's more about the t- tricks and tips we can learn to make our job easier. And I thought, you know, that is so true. Mm. Uh, who else is producing great stuff? The guys over at Free Salon Education are doing some stuff that's not bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Matt, uh, oh my goodness! I can't think of his name either. Uh, I'm just completely drawn a blank. <laughs> For everybody listening, I will Matt put a Beck. link in Matt, Matt Beck. Beck. I'll put yeah. a link in the show notes Beck, to right. uh, all these guys we're talking about, so you can go and follow up with them and yeah. find out more. I've um, never met Matt, but just from his videos, he seems like a really genuine, you know, cool dude. I, I like Matt a lot, even though I've never met him. Though. Yeah, yeah, no, neither. I've, I haven't even had a chance to speak to him, but I, I love the videos they do. They do some good stuff and. Yeah, and I think mm-hmm. it comes from, like we were saying, a place it's, that is about education and sharing, not necessarily about filling that void or seeking validation of the work they do, yeah. which is really, really yeah. good. It's a, it's a scary thing that, that when you go out and, and you start to share you know, your philosophies and the way you think about things, uh, because someone will ev- ev- eventually ask you a question and you think, I never thought about that. And then when you start thinking about it, you realize they pointed out a hole in your technique. And so it's, it's that realization of, okay, let me kind of protect myself and defend myself from, and it makes it difficult to, to, to share, but it does make you a lot better when you go and you share your stuff and you share your opinion. And as long as you just present it and say, Hey, this is just the way I do it. Take the good, discard the bad, you know, Bruce Lee, take what's good, use it. What you don't like, Chuck it. Exactly. And, and I must say, I'm reading a few different Bruce Lee books, and, and there's a lot of philosophy there that take yeah. it out of martial arts, but it's very life important. Yeah. Well, without a doubt, without yeah. a doubt, you know, especially, and it can, can really apply to pretty much anything, you know. It's a lot about self-reflection. Yeah. And I think anybody that spends a lot of time in self-reflection, it, it makes them a better person. You know, and that's part of, of the, the path of being a great hairdresser. And when you first start doing hair, you're learning technique. Let me learn how to do what the client asked for. Let me learn how to cut hair so that I have a clue. And then as you get good at doing hair and you can please the client, you start getting good at the personal relationship side of it. Okay, let let me build a personal relationship with the client in the chair and deal with that part of the whole salon interaction. And then you start, after you get good at that and being able to have a conversation and make them feel good and warm and fuzzy inside, you start thinking about, okay, what am I doing to hold myself back? You start reflecting on yourself and how you are preventing yourself from really growing. That's just the, the hardest stage is admitting to yourself, you know, where I screw up, you know, and, and admitting to yourself, yeah, I shouldn't have said that to that person. I'm an asshole. 
You know, it's, it's hard to admit that, but that's part of, of the obstacles that we have to, to hurdle over down the road of the hairdresser life. Most definitely. It's and tough. It's, and, it's, and it's a constant, it's a constant struggle because I find myself now, you know, I, I've put a lot of effort into training, a lot of effort into my personal skills and I still stuff up, you know, it, it just happens. Yeah. You, you have a b- yeah. bad day, you, you, something that pisses you off in your personal life and it's hard to keep it separate and you do take it into the salon. Yeah. And yeah. you think, yeah. Oh, yeah, I really shouldn't have done that or said that. And those are the days you probably should shut the door and go home. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. I mean, because then if you go home, are you sick? No, not really. Just, I'm just having a bad day. Yeah. Oh, well, suck it up, Chumley, you know. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of sympathy from a client, you know. <laughs> you don't want me cutting you got to take care of number one. Exactly. What's and, that? Um, you, yeah, you, when you go into the salon pissed off, you, you, people don't want you cutting their hair that day. Not at all. Yeah, well, but they don't want you not cutting it because That's they it. don't know when they're going to get in next time. <laughs> so yeah. I warn them. I tell them, I tell them if I'm having a bad hair day, you know, where I'm not cutting good hair, I'll tell them, you know, I don't know if you want me cutting your hair today. I'm, I'm a little bit off today. And some of them are like, okay, I'll just wait till you're on. Okay. <laughs> I stopped doing that because then I had clients call up. Is he on today? <laughs> oh yeah, he's on. So, <laughs> so you put a call out looking for um, students to mentor. How that? How that go? Yeah, I, I you know I'm working on a, a new website. You know, hair mentor because the mentoring aspect here in the United States is is really lackluster and it's there is a, a a huge vacuum of people to share and pass knowledge down. And not everybody has an opportunity to go to a salon and apprentice someone that's that's really skilled or knowledgeable or, or even cares. Um, there, there's a lot of, you know, burnt out folks out there that don't take time for themselves like, you know, we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and it's hard to, to give of yourself if you don't have a lot in your own heart to give. So I'm trying to do this hair mentor website. And I'm thinking, okay, what's the best way for me to to share the the have you heard of the 80 20 rule? You know, 80% yes, of your yeah. work comes from 20% of your efforts, sort of thing. I'm thinking, what is the 20% that I can give somebody that will give them 80% of their success? What are the key things that I can really focus on or teach somebody uh, and mentor somebody so that they can make a living? There's so many people that go to beauty school, they get out. They go try to find a job. They either get a job assisting, shampooing hair and making minimum wage and can't make a living, or they go work at a you know a quick service salon and they don't make enough money to really grow. And no one's really showing them what it takes to be successful. And so, so many people just die on the vine as soon as they graduate beauty school. The first couple of years, I mean, it's a massacre, a massacre. I, I mean, there's no telling what the percentage is. Some people say it's high as 90%. 98 percent i i wouldn't doubt if it was 98 percent in the first five years are no longer in the business and it's not because there's a lack of of love for the craft there's a lack of knowledge a lack of anyone showing them so i i put out a little post on facebook that said uh you know i'm looking for 10 people uh that's willing to go through a mentoring program with me they got to be you know local and so uh, i got uh you know i got 12 or 13 people sign up i only took 10 you know and i asked them why do you want to do hair? You know, I, I don't expect anything, you know, profound, but I, what I wanted to hear from, from their why was something about servicing somebody else, something about giving to somebody else, as opposed to it being, oh, I really love doing hair. I love making people you know, look good. I love this. I love that. I, I wanted it to be more of, I want someone to feel good about the way they look. I wanted it to be from a perspective of, making the client feel good, giving the client a good service, giving a client, you know, a self-esteem boost or, or making them happy. And so anybody that answered that, you know, in, in that vein, which was most of them, uh, came in. And uh, I started out last Monday was my, my first week. And I did a, the basic haircut, V-layer. And you hold everything down, you cut it one length, hold everything up in the middle of the mohawk section, you cut it all in the center. I covered about an hour of some haircutting theory, you know, how to control weight and movement and just how to cut a straight line sort of thing. And uh, then we did the haircut and we all, I did a demonstration and then they did it. I learned a lot from that first class of teaching these 10 people. What is so second nature for me? Section, comb, clean, bam. I mean, I, I just do it automatically and naturally get it clean from roots to the ends. It's so hard for someone new to come in and create the the physical dexterity that's required to be able to cut a clean straight line and keep their mind where they're supposed to be and, and know all these things. And they're not even carrying a conversation on. 
So it, it's going to take a little bit of time. So I think that they all did fairly well. You know, they, they I didn't have anybody that didn't want to be there. So that certainly helps. Yeah. Um, I think they all did well, but some of them could not follow. I mean, it's okay. cut it down. I did everything. I showed them what to do. And then next thing you know, they're going from horizontal sections to vertical sections, and their sections are not parallel, and they're working all over the place. Uh-huh. So I think um, I, I, I have, I'm beginning to develop the philosophy that educating young people today, you cannot give them war and peace or cutting hair the Sassoon way. You can't give them a Bible of hair you know, and expect them to, to read it. You have to feed it to them in tweets. They can only understand or comprehend 160 characters at a time, you know? So give it to them one tweet at a time, one tweet at a time, one tweet at a time, then they'll be able to retain it because everything is so sensory overloaded today that it's hard for people to focus. So I think that this next class, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have everybody get their doll head and we're all going to section it the same way, all at the same time. And then I'm going to take a section and then they're going to take the same section. I'm going to take the next section. They're going to take the next section. I'm going to comb the first section. cut it. So we're going to do basically the tweet haircut. One tweet at a time, one cut, one section at a time, and hopefully that can that can start to get some some repetitive. And I think we're going to do the same haircut twice. So repetitive, you know, repetition is the mother's skill. So okay. it's really opening my eyes of, of the difficulty that it is to train someone that's young in the business and how there has to be a lot of self motivation to strive to be excellent that I cannot teach them mm-hmm. because. I was talking to an educator about a, a child's brain and as they develop and how, how young adolescents develop. And there's a certain you know growth that the brain goes through where they can't comprehend algebra. They can understand 2 plus 2 equals 4, but they cannot comprehend 2 plus B equals 4. What is B? They can't understand that. And okay. then as the brain develops... You know, they they do it enough, then all of a sudden a light bulb goes off and clicks. Ah, I got it. They can understand these abstract terms. Haircutting is a lot like that. You start and you struggle and you struggle and you don't get it and you don't get it and you don't get it. And then all of a sudden one day, pop, it clicks and it's like, I got it. And and it's tough because you're taking a three-dimensional shape that you're cutting on somebody's head and you're compressing it into two dimensions of your finger. And then after you cut it into your in your two dimensions of your finger, you're releasing it and the three-dimensional shape is now collapsing. So to make that, that leap in your mind of three-dimensional shape, compressed, released, and collapsing, that's a lot to, to take in. And it takes a while for people to learn that. It certainly does. I think... I don't um, know what... <laughs> here in Australia, does that make any sense at all? It does. Yeah, here in Australia, we we have I think it's now a three year apprenticeship. So okay. the number that go to like a beauty school are, are, are very minimal compared to the people who do an in salon apprenticeship with going off to beauty school once a, a week or a month or whatever. And it yeah. is, you know, you're dealing with young people. Their attention spans very limited. I tend to be a, a bit of a, a perfectionist, and I grasp it straight away. Why can't you? And that, that was that's been one of my biggest things with educating. People, apprentices yeah. in the salon, I guess. Uh, people in general, it's not so bad because you see them for that period of time and they're gone. An apprentice, they're there five, six days a week. And, you know, yeah. if they yeah. frustrate you, they frustrate you yeah. for days on end. And, and it's true, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I, I guess it's it's teaching them in tweet sections. Yeah, that, that's really great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what, tough. What's the, um, it's tough. What's the level of experience of, of the people you're mentoring at the moment? Is, is it less than five years or...? Oh, yes. Yeah. All under five years. I'd say probably most of them are around uh, two years, year and a half, okay. two years. They're all out of school. They're all, most of them are apprenticing in a salon. There might be a few that are doing hair in a salon, but it's on a very limited basis. A lot of apprentices that are still going through the apprenticeship program and, and still trying to get their feet wet, you know, still trying to, to search and find that, that voice that they have to, to share, you know, and it's hard to, to share that voice if you don't know how to sing or talk. So yeah. it's, it's like we're trying to learn how to talk. Awesome. In the hair business, so to speak. Uh-oh. And um, losing my ear. Just thinking back to ed- uh, educators, you said alike. Uh, I've been watching a little bit of stuff from Alan Benfield Bush lately. Uh huh. And one thing that I, I really admire that he he has tried to do is create a universal language for hairdressers, which is something I've found mm-hmm. very very difficult. Now that I'm attending education through Paul Mitchell, now I've become a Paul Mitchell salon, looking at uh, different education online and and videos and that, everything has a different way of describing it. And it's usually the same thing. And that must just drive 
people new to the industry, I know it drives me crazy and I've been in it for a long time. So I I don't know how it affects people that are just trying to get their head around something when it's all new to them. There's times when people use terminology that's completely the opposite of terminology that somebody else uses. Mm. And so it's very, very confusing. And I I think sometimes it's confusing for no reason. When when I'm teaching a class, I use very little terminology at all. I, I don't I don't ever really talk about over direction unless I'm trying to explain something to someone that thinks in over-direction kind of terms. I, I, I pull it straight up to the ceiling, straight down to the floor, forward, left, right, T to my parting. It's always like I try to cut out as much terminology as possible. Uh, terminology can be a barrier to communication because if we don't communicate using the same terminology, then nobody understands. So I always try to cut as much of that out as possible because it doesn't really matter in the end. It doesn't matter, you know, yeah. If it's triangular graduation or square graduation, or it's, it doesn't matter. Especially someone that's new to the business doesn't need to get into the, the esoterics of terminology. Mm-hmm. They're just trying to do a freaking haircut to make the client happy. <laughs> that's exactly so, right. Uh, yeah. I, I cut all that, as much of it out as possible. Yeah, that's great. And that's what I find I tend to do. Uh, I find it easier just to, like you said, I, I'm either pulling it up, pulling it out, pulling it towards this, doing that, sectioning it this way, sectioning it that way. And it saves me a hell of a lot of confusion, let alone trying to teach somebody yeah, that hasn't been doing it for 20 odd years. Yeah. <laughs> It's simpler. It's more straightforward. It's more concise, and yeah. and somebody can can just can just grasp it. If I'm teaching you engineering and I'm using engineering terms, or, or see, even when you go to the doctor, the doctor says, "Oh, you've got uh, mangina gravis." I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. They say, "Oh, you, you, something's whatever. You got a cold." Okay, I got it. But it, it's they can use terminology and just we become swimming because we don't understand what the terminology is. You have to say, "Oh, speak English." <laughs> when uh, when Michael came down for uh, when Michael came down for Wizard Council, I mean, it was really great having him here, and he is he is such a cool dude. You know, he came down and just rolled with the punches and and just you know whenever you're doing one of those shows, it never goes off like you hope it does, and it's like we were expecting maybe 40 people. 45, 50 was, was, you know, we were, we were doing good at 50. And when we started, there was a line of 30 people lined up out front buying tickets to get in, which we did not expect at all. And so the place was packed. And, uh, I mean, we were running behind on getting people in and getting things over and, and, and stuff like this. And, oh, I mean, it was, you know, you always know how things are supposed to go. So when it's over, you think, oh, what a disaster. But hopefully that the people that were there enjoyed it and, and, they had some great hair, so yeah, yeah he had but a he massive was such turnout. a great guy. Michael is just yeah, awesome. He was such a, uh, you know, yeah. I I put yeah. him on the spot for my first podcast, and mm-hmm. he was just great and obliging to do that for me. And he just he's got so much. And uh, we just finished interviewing Van Council last week, and, and what an amazing guy! Yeah, you know, Van's just, a cool guy. Van's a cool oh, guy. Look, uh, when I was when I was young, growing up, you know, Van Council was just popping on the scene with the Veda, and uh, he had a couple of hot salons in Atlanta. And so, being from Kentucky, I get out of school and I'm doing like these photo shoots and stuff like that. And I think I want to go work somewhere where it's really hip and cool. So I got in a car, I drove freaking seven hours to Atlanta and uh, I went in and uh, go into a salon and said, Oh yeah, I'd like to uh, apply for a job. I drove here from Kentucky and all this stuff. And I had a bunch of slides of, of haircuts that I had done and I filled out the application and I had the slides and I had a little resume, which was, you know, nothing on it because, you know, shit, I'm just out of school. I've been a hairdresser for a couple of years. And um, so I, I put it off there. OK, great. You know, and I never freaking heard back from him. That hurt my feelings so bad. I'm like, at least say, hey, dude, I appreciate you coming in. But, you know, it's just like nothing. So I always whenever someone comes in, I always try to at least say, you know, I don't have any spots right now. I really appreciate you coming in and all that. But I ended up meeting him uh, face-to-face for the first time when I was doing the interview with Christopher Brooker. And, and he was he was the cool dude. I didn't tell him that I had gone to, you know, Atlanta and applied at his, at his salon and got snubbed and all that. But, but he was a cool guy. I, I liked him. Yeah. Nice guy. And that was a great interview with Christopher Brooker too. It, yeah. What an amazing guy. He was just really great to watch. Yeah, yeah. And it, when I was going to edit that, I figured – Oh, I'll edit this down to about five minutes, just the interview part where, because I, I went to the, the hotel room and I had like 30 minutes, like beginning to end. So I tried to set things up as quick as possible. I didn't have any lights. 
I just turned every light on in the hotel room and set up a camera and turned the mic on him. And I was just so, you know, like nervous about doing the whole thing. Let's make sure we get him. I didn't have anything for me or the two shot or a microphone on me or anything like that. And it was, it was technically, it was horrible, horrible. But uh, he was so great, and the information he provided was so on point and honest and sincere. I thought, I hope that when I mature in my career that I can be as humble and as cool and as honest and, and have as much dignity as he has. You know, for as much as he's been through and, and all his career in life, he is so modest and humble and, and cool and nice. And, and, and I really like that dude. I like him a lot. So I figured, let me just go ahead and put the whole video up. I'm not going to bother to edit it because anybody that's going to want to watch the video is going to want to see the whole thing. Uh, yeah. So, le so let me, I would want to see the whole thing. Yeah. So I just put the whole thing up. Yeah. Now that was definitely Now cool. the, the, uh, the show part was like six hours long. It was like five and a half hours long. <laughs> I know. It was incredible. I had to edit that down. Yeah. That looked really yeah, that, good. That man can talk. <laughs> I, I got that. that. Man can, I got that from there. Yeah. Oh, Yes. Yeah, and Horst was there in attendance, and, and, and it was great to see him, you know. Not, yeah, I like Horst a lot. There, there is some definitely some great characters in this industry, and yeah. it's, you know, the last 12 months has been an absolute blast for me getting to talk to so many of them. It's It's been amazing. My only, my only regret is I'm stuck on the other side of the world, and I'm not going to get a chance to meet a lot of them for a long time. But uh, we're planning on going to the ice show next year. Uh, really? Yeah. Really? Apparently, apparently they tell me So Magazine is going to the ice show, so. I, Great. I don't know if I'll have to edit this out, whether it's a secret or not. But we're yeah. uh, also going to yeah. the uh, Sassoon mashup after after it when it's on something like nice. that. Nice. So um, yeah, Tony nice. Tony Beckerman invited nice. us. So another great wow. guy. Tony Beckerman is just an amazing guy. The yeah, knowledge Tony Beckerman's cool guy. The knowledge that pours yeah. out of him is just like oh, it's it's a pity yeah. you have to stop an interview after an hour because you could just sit there forever. And and just towards the yeah, end of the Tony interview, was cool, okay. he was just getting on the roll, and it's like, oh, really? Now we got to stop. <laughs> you should have just kept it rolling. Just kept it. He going. had to go and pick pulled up. out a Christopher Brooker six-hour interview. <laughs> <laughs> he had to go and pick up his kids from school or something, uh, or, or something like that. Oh. I don't know what it was. So we had to gotcha. stop. It was such a pity. But yeah, he was he was. Gotcha. Great. You know, there's just been so many that have been so good. It's yeah. unbelievable. Hair brand are doing really really well. They're doing some good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like Hairbrain. I like the guys, uh, you know, a lot. I think that they're doing a, a lot for the industry and, you know, trying to bring things together a little bit, bring a little camaraderie in. And, uh, you know, that that's one of the things that, that makes the industry so great is is the camaraderie between stylists. You know, is if you can get past the ones with the ego, you know, and, and get to the others, I mean, you can have some really great, true, deep friendships and, and the, the sharing that goes on, you know. It's, it's really wonderful because there's nothing that anyone hasn't – there's nothing that I can experience that someone hasn't already experienced before me. Yeah. So if I'm going through something, I say, hey, Anthony, I got this issue with this assistant. What do you think? And you can say, dude, I had that exact same thing happen to me last year, and this is how I handled it, and this is how I would do it differently. A wealth of knowledge for the people that aren't afraid to ask. Mm, most definitely. And it's so easy to get. You just have to go ask for it. And uh, yeah, that's one thing I, I have learned in the last 18 months is if you ask, people are willing to share and are happy yeah. to. It's yeah. the only time yeah. we get any sort of resistance for anything like that, I, I guess from more local salons uh, and local hairdressers mm. where mm. they still have this mentality that you're going to steal something from them. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. And, right. you know, they're not – they don't want to build – and it's a, it's a pity because it would be lovely to have that – that network, a local network, build up. I feel, and it's just uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. it's and I don't know if you experience the same thing where you are. That you know, they just you know, we're all in the same business. We like you said, we all have the same problems. The chances are we could help each other if we could just put our little yeah. egos aside and and do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe it's some of it is fear of being exposed. You know, for, because I have a salon and I'm running it. And I have no idea what I'm doing. I have an idea what I think I ought to do. But, but you know, it's kind of like I'm just doing the best that I can. And so there, there's a certain fear that someone's going to be able to, to pull back the curtain and expose, aha, gotcha, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And you're going to say, no, I don't. 
So, yeah, that, that, that happens every day when I go to work to cut hair. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's... Uh, that, that was it, one it's of the, tough. That was it's one of the tough. things that we were discussing at uh, the magazine was that unlike most people I entered this business, my mother was a hairdresser, her aunt was a hairdresser, so, you know, it's, yeah. like you, it's it's been a family thing. And I entered this business yeah. not so much because I had any passion for doing hair. It's because I like the business side of it. So for me, it's mm-hmm. always been mm-hmm. about the business which is probably why I sucked at hair for so long. And <laughs> and now... Not until I, you decided it was a necessity did you learn it, right? Pretty much. You know, I, I got to the point, you know, I'd already owned yeah. salons. I had staff. Uh, you know, I'm humble. I was not the best hair cutter in that salon. And I, chances yeah. are I'm probably still not the best yeah. hair cutter I'll ever have in my salon. But, <laughs> but right. I'm, I'm getting better. And it's, you know, I just wish we'd had yeah more camaraderie uh, and the ability to share within the community, I probably would have got to the realization that I have a lot sooner and had people yeah. there to help me because, you know, I, I know there's been some really great hairdressers pass through the, this area and it would have been great to have learned from them. So, yeah. 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 That, that reminds me, you know, I've always been, like since my father was in the business and my father knew uh, a lot of people and uh, he was very well respected in the business for his uh, technical ability. Um he had a lot of friends that, that, you know, I knew just from, he was my dad. So they, they were very uh, open and uh, nice to me. And so I never really saw much of the, the shun side of things uh, until much later when I started to have some success. But uh, I mean, I was just kind of oblivious and and I would just go and ask anybody for help. Um, There is a time when I was uh, in beauty school, I had, I had started doing hair for, for about a year you know, just playing around and working in the in dad's salon illegally. But I'll deny it if that ever comes to light again. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't have a license and I was just cutting my friend's hair and stuff like that. And he was teaching me. And I went to beauty school. And when I was getting uh, close to graduating, uh, Trevor Sorby was doing a class in Atlanta. You know, Atlanta is, is 350 miles, 400 miles away. So I hopped in the car Saturday after work. I drove all night. I got there, you know, Early, early, I, I went and had breakfast, and at 6 o'clock, I'm at the hotel where the, the show's at. And I'm walking the hotel looking for the prep room. And sure enough, there's the prep room. I walk in, and people are just getting set up, and there's Trevor. And I said, hey, Trevor, how you doing? He said, hey, how are you? I said, I'm here to help. Anything you need, you tell me I'm here to help you with your hair. I'm your right hand. You got it. He says, oh, great. Well, come on over here. This is what I want you to do. And I sat down and started making these little gel curls that he would make these these wig hair pieces out of. And I just sat there for hours making these gel curls. And then when he had the model and he was putting them on and he's looking at it, and he'd, he'd say, so what do you think of that? And I'd kind of look at it and I wouldn't say much. He goes, no, what, really, what's your opinion? I said, I think it needs something over here. He goes, I think you're right. And so then he'd add some there and I'm thinking, oh, shit, Trevor Sorby just asked me my opinion. Oh, Wow. <laughs> you know, and I was I was nobody. I was just a kid that was excited, and I showed up, and I asked, "Hey, you need any help? I'm here to help." It wasn't like, "Oh, what are you going to pay me to go assist and drive my ass all the way down to Atlanta?" And no, I was, I'm going to go, and I'm going to. Of course, I didn't have a ticket for the show, but since I was helping, I snuck in the back and and got to watch the show from the backstage because hey, what should I help? I worked for that ticket, but it was. A great experience. And then when I, you know, left the, Kentucky and ended up going to New York City and worked there, you know, it was because I'd had such a great experience with, you know, with Trevor and, and, and Vivian McKinder, who was always was very, very nice to me as well. And so when I went up to John Delaria, I said, hey, John, what's going on? And he said, hey, why don't you come work in New York? You got it. And that's just you just go and put yourself in play. That's a hard thing to do is to put yourself in play. And it's that fear of rejection. But I was too stupid to, to realize, and I just went and did it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you, you either have to be, you be like that. And, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, you're right. I think it is. It's half the battle's showing up, and, yeah, the other mm-hmm. half is just making sure you do and put yourself in play. And I think it's yeah. that maybe that's the benefit of age now. I just don't care. You know, they can reject me all they want. Yeah. I'll just keep putting myself out there because I no longer care yeah. anymore what anybody thinks or says. I'm going to do what I want to do, yeah. and I do. And 
it's just opened up an entire new world to me and it's like wow I didn't have that maturity 20 years ago to do that but I do now and I'm glad I do yeah I I think that you know just the a certain amount of fearlessness that comes with age or you know you don't give a shit anymore just bulldog through it you know I think that that's a that's a beautiful thing you're a beautiful man Anthony a beautiful man look at you thank you thank you all just barreling through It's, uh, which is the same thing I did when I started this podcast. I had no idea what I was doing. I just went and bought a shitload of equipment and decided I'm going to start. Yeah, doing and a how's podcast. Uh, how's that going? It's going good. Uh, we how's had your a, podcast going? It, we had a bit of a slump over Easter. I basically didn't do anything, and uh, it's, right. it's been great. Right. And I and I'm putting out hopefully some useful content for people. I'm alternating that with blog posts, so I'm always putting out something there to share. Uh, um, I'm very big on giving as much as I can back to the industry now and, and whatever I can to help and yep. share with people, which, I, I, you know, as you know, I've pretty much done through the Hair Maven uh, forum. Anything I could share and help people with, I'm always glad to. And this is yep, just a new yep. format. Totally. It's I, I'm a terrible writer. I hate you know to sit down at a keyboard and have to write something. I'm really – it takes me a long, long time to get any sort of content out. Where being a hairdresser, we right. talk – so having a podcast, I can yeah. just sit and talk and talk and talk and talk, and I can produce wonderful yeah. content without any yeah. problem whatsoever. Any plans to release some new videos? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, this this hair mentor gig, went, I'm trying to, to par it down to about 12 classes, and um, I, I think that I'm going to release that as an online course and as a, a DVD set, you know, awesome. a set of, you know, six DVDs or something because not everybody's going to learn it online. And, and if I go to a trade show, I can't sell an online membership. I have to have something physical to sell. And, uh, I think that there's something to be said, like for me, I mean, maybe I'm just old, but I like the idea of going and getting a physical, you know, DVD. So I have the, the, the information and I can keep it. Whereas if it's online, shit, I've lost stuff online. You lose pictures and stuff online, and where's it gone? I don't know. Can't get it again. Well, that's all we have for this week. Thank you again for listening, and don't forget to leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It helps other people find this podcast. If you're listening through the website, I would love you to leave a comment below, maybe sharing your thoughts on training younger people and how you've dealt with it. Also, feel free to click the like buttons and share this podcast with your friends via your favorite social media channel. Also, if you have a question or something you would like me to cover in a future episode, or if you have a message you would like to share with the Salon world, drop me an email, message me on Facebook or LinkedIn, and we can set up a time to have you on the Business Insider podcast. Thanks for listening, and see you in two weeks.